if you ask me to, to sift through the crypto industry and say what's valuable, well, what's valuable is Hello everyone today, our guest is Michael Saylor. CEO of MicroStrategy might be his day job, but when it comes to his public persona, it's Michael Saylor's passion for Bitcoin that stands out. Saylor and his company MicroStrategy believe in Bitcoin so much that the company took out a $205 million loan in March, collateralized by Bitcoin, to buy more Bitcoin. In this video, Michael Saylor talks about the current state of the crypto market, his assessment of it, the value and real definition of Bitcoin, and its implications and usage in the future financial world. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. Bitcoin dipped in the minutes after US CPI data came in hotter than expected, increasing to 9.1% in June from 8.8% in May. Bitcoin's price fell 4.2% to about $19,200 in the minutes since the report was released. Speculation might be that the Federal Reserve will have to keep tightening monetary conditions aggressively to tamp down inflation. Inflation rose by 1.3% in June, marking a rise in consumer prices by 9.1% over the last 12 months, according to the latest Consumer Price Index report. This places inflation at another 40-year high, the largest annual rise in consumer prices since November 1981. Food, gas, and shelter were the largest contributors to inflation last month, with rent prices increasing significantly, rising by 0.8%. But aside from increases in food and gas prices, June also saw significant price upticks in apparel, household furnishings, and car insurance. As wages struggle to keep up with skyrocketing prices for basic goods and more companies initiate layoffs, U.S. households, particularly low-income Americans, are feeling severe financial strain on their wallets. The stock market is also taking a hit, with the S&P 500 down by 20% this year. In an attempt to slow the economy and wrangle staggering inflation, the Federal Reserve plans to raise the federal funds rate again in July. But many financial experts worry that if inflation comes down too quickly, the U.S. could face a recession. Or, if inflation remains high while unemployment rates tick up, we could fall into a period of stagflation. The slowdown in the U.S. economy during the first quarter of 2022 has raised concerns of a recession, but stagflation fears are steadily mounting. According to Bank of America's latest fund manager survey, 83% of investors expect a period of stagflation within the next 12 months. A recession refers to a period of prolonged economic decline and market contraction, where the unemployment rate goes up and production goes down, generally slowing inflation. Stagflation, on the other hand, refers to a period where a recession is uniquely coupled with high inflation. And, and even when I say uh, this is digital energy, well, you know, uh, I don't know, two thirds of the people in the crypto industry for the last decade, they don't understand what I'm saying. So there are people that have been in the crypto industry for a decade that have master's degrees in computer science, and they think that they're very informed. And they don't even understand what I'm saying. And, and, they, and they've got such a strong bias toward their point of view that they're unwilling to accept the new idea and even stop and think about it for a bit. So I, I don't think it's limited to non-technologists. I think non-technologists would look and you would say, okay, well, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is digital money. What is money? You remember you guys sat through 20 hours of my lectures on what is money? Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a secret. I didn't know what money was when Robert Breedlove asked me to go and do the podcast. He said, come on my show called What is Money? And I said, well, gosh, I guess I'd better think about what is money before I get on the show. And then I ended up writing out a 10 page outline and it becomes 30 hours of discussions. But but, you know, I got to the year 2020 without thinking about what is money. Most of the people in the world don't know what is money. So if you say it's digital money, that doesn't click. And then if you say uh, it's digital property. Most people don't know what property is. They haven't thought about the definition of property or property rights. What is that really, right? Do you own your own stuff if you live in North Korea? Do you own anything? 
right? I mean, what, what does it mean to own anything? And then, of course, if you call it digital energy, most people don't, well, they, they, they're like, oh, no, it's not energy. You can't run a car on it. But then they haven't thought about what is a digital map or digital music or digital communications or digital relationship. And the whole point of money is money is energy, economic energy, and therefore, i.e., conservative and so when Satoshi invented something that allowed you to transfer a value from two parties without an intermediary, not only did Satoshi invent the ability to transfer energy in cyberspace, Satoshi invented the ability to manifest energy in cyberspace, something conservative. Well, people that are computer scientists don't understand conservation of energy. If you, if you think about the Bitcoin economy, layer two is is open uh, permissionless transaction protocols. Okay, layer one is the, mon the open permissionless monetary protocol, which is the thing we call Bitcoin. And uh, layer two, the, the most famous example of a layer two is lightning, an open permissionless transaction protocol. But, but by no means is it the only possible layer two in, th in theory, if you create an open permissionless protocol that integrates with Bitcoin, it could be a competitor to Lightning. But right now, Lightning looks like the dominant open, per, open permissionless transaction protocol. Then you've got layer three. Layer three would be an application uh, and maybe a famous example would be like PayPal or uh, Cash App payment applications. What would make you believe that your thesis on Bitcoin was incorrect. Like, is there something, an event, like a single type of event where you'd be like, okay, this is actually making me question my conviction. If I saw something better. Okay. It's like, you know, if you invent a fusion reactor that can run a Tesla on a sugar cube for a hundred years, <laughs> and you ask me whether I would buy that instead of the Tesla, all other things being equal, I think I like the car with the fusion motor or the atomic overthruster. I just haven't okay. seen it. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I mean, Bitcoin at its core is more of an ideology. The ideology is let's implement conservation of energy in cyberspace by a, a protocol which is fair and equitable. They have done that, right? So can someone implement a, uh, you know, uh, and every other thing that competes with it isn't a fair and equitable protocol for implementing conservation of energy in cyberspace. It's something different, right? When you start inflating the supply of the tokens by 5%, or when you have a foundation or an issuer or an ICO or an investment contract, and it's proprietary, or you keep hard forking and hard forking, right? That's not conservation of energy via an open permissionless protocol in cyberspace. It's something different. The things that are closest to Bitcoin Right, where the Bitcoin forks, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. And if you look at Bitcoin Cash, it has collapsed by 99.5%, right? It's now like 50 basis points of Bitcoin. So, the, and I would say Bitcoin Cash, right, is probably the closest thing to Bitcoin that was supposed to be an improvement. Obviously not. Bitcoin at layer one, it's, it's good enough. It's good enough to be a $100 trillion base layer. It's good enough to be 200x bigger than it is. It's good enough to be a $500 trillion base layer, right? That's not the part that needs fixing. That, that's the base 10 math. At this point, everybody ought to be working on applications, derivatives, services, other protocols, and they ought to stop trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, it's just, it's just not very productive, right? The reason that that hasn't been as lucrative is there's nothing more lucrative than selling an unregistered security to the retail public. That's, it's just illegal and unethical. It's lucrative, but that's the dilemma, right? If I'm willing to break the law in an unethical way, then yeah, I can get it financed. It's just, there's nothing right about it. Like a Luna, right? You generate $50 billion of tokens and you had, you know, and you gen up the token and you have a billion dollars, you know, at some point when you're manipulating your unregistered security, you know, offshore, you know, and dumping it on the general public, what could go wrong? It, it's pretty obvious that you can generate. If I wanted to generate a, a $10 billion market cap, right, I just, I issue a token 
I, I put 1% in the float and then I just buy the 1% of the float and then I publish it and then I tell everybody that's a $10 billion market cap. That's what it looks like. So, well, you know, Michael, then, then I just... if I give it to you, right, if I give it to you mm. and and I get you to promote my NFT or my something, then I basically used an unregistered security stock offering without disclosure to pump the underlying network. It's highly unethical, but it has been going on. If you ha if I had to have an opinion on what I see in front of me, what you see is this is this is something that was sold as an ICO to the public. The ETH Foundation, con Ethereum Foundation controls it. It's an investment contract, right? It's been hard forked multiple times. And the hard forks aren't just hard forks to fix the fatal bug. They're hard forks that change the underlying monetary protocol. And the protocol keeps materially changing and it is never stabilized. Right now, you've got an ETH mining, uh, an ETH mining constituency and every you know, every year for the past five years, they've had a difficulty bomb to destroy it and they keep putting it off. Well, who's they? The miners don't want to destroy themselves. So who's controlling the network? Not the miners, right? There's a small group of developers that control what the network is. And that's a company. It's a software company. And ETH is an equity and they've sold it to the general public and they keep changing the protocol hard forks are just software upgrades that are mandatory so it's not a decentralized network it's not a commodity there's no reasonable person that understands the law or ethics could conclude that that ethereum is a commodity right you can't gary gensler doesn't think it's a commodity you can read his videos on it right uh it does it passes the howey test as an investment contract the question you got to ask yourself is who makes the decisions and what's the basis they make the decision. If you ask me to, to sift through the crypto industry and say what's valuable, well, what's valuable is the idea of a stable coin. Clearly, the world wants trillions of dollars of digital currency in the form of the US dollar or the digital euro, et cetera. That's valuable. What's valuable is digital property, which is what Bitcoin is. The establishment of a non uh, of a open an open uh, censorship resistant digital commodity with a protocol that is universally understood, right? Um, that has not got an issuer, that fails the Howey test, that is not an investment contract. That is an innovation. That is Satoshi's innovation, right? Um, and uh, so that's the second thing that's valuable. I think the third thing that's valuable is being a, is crypt, uh, the ability to move crypto assets point peer to peer, right? Instantly for free. I think 24 seven, 365 trading is valuable. And I think the idea of, of tokenizing, uh, tokenizing things, tokens, they're interesting, they're valuable. NFTs are tokens, they're valuable. Right. So ultimately, all those things will probably find their way into the ecosystem. But just because just because those things are valuable doesn't justify anybody buying any random token or any random coin. Right. Well, I mean, the only people that would think that it uh, is not energy efficient are people that don't understand it. And they either don't understand it because they're completely outside of the space or uh, they don't understand it because it's in their uh, professional interest not to understand it and they're competing to promote a proof of stake network. So most of the anti-Bitcoin energy usage narratives are actually under, they're underwritten by the proof of stake promoters, right? And, and that's where most of that FUD comes from. It doesn't really come from outsiders. The outsiders would look at it and say it's a data center and you put electricity in and you spit out blocks of digital energy According to a recent survey conducted by Opinio, and despite the collapse in crypto prices and the start of the bear market, more than half, 55%, of crypto investors held their investments in response to the recent crypto asset market sell-off, with just 8% selling their investments. This suggests that the investment conviction of a majority of crypto investors remains strong. The study also found that 33% of American investors are invested in crypto assets, and 40% of investors believe Bitcoin presents the best investment opportunity over the next three months.
If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.